Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for a very generous introduction. I don't know about the truth content of that, uh, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, so welcome everyone, and uh, very good morning. So today I'll be talking about uh, like you know knowledge graphs and what my lab does. Some of like kind of like more recent uh, work in this area. Uh, so my group is called the Machine and Language Learning Lab. Uh, so like you know we are like as fun as like a mall, uh, like you know like your shopping mall, uh, but we lack the food court. Uh, right, so so that's why we name our servers after local snacks. So we'll have like the you know, dosa, idli, momo. Those are our server names, right? Uh, and um, so the group itself is so uh, like you know, has members from uh, CSA department, the CDS department, and also the E department. And we are housed in the CDS building. So if you get a chance, I will welcome you to come and visit and interact with lab members while you are here. Uh, so uh, I just want to kind of like point out that uh, like you know AI in IAC is actually uh, quite thriving and like you know is uh, supported by lots of different departments. And of course, there is lots of activities here in CSA. Then we also have the CDS department. There are people in ECE, EE, and ESC uh, who do lots of work around uh, uh, AI, uh, like you know, in uh, various different ways. So if you haven't seen, uh, maybe like just a couple of months back, uh, we launched this website, uh, www.ai.iac.ac.in, and uh, which kind of like gives you as a good starting point uh, to know about AI-related activities uh, in the institute, right? So which uh, lists uh, like the various uh, projects, research areas, but also uh, people uh, who are working on AI-related topics and courses, events, and things like that. Right? Also people write, software and make it available so that's also available from this link so i welcome you to come and take a look at this and these are roughly the areas of ai related activities so like you know, there's of course lots of work around the foundations of ai but also around uh, deep learning uh, speech and image processing computer vision uh, natural language processing uh, systems aspects of doing ai right so if you don't have the uh, right system and the hardware like you know uh, be it like security uh, reliability and all of that thing you cannot like achieve many of these other goals and also increasingly what is uh, important area called cyber physical systems uh, how like you know you can kind of like bridge this gap between our physical world and the cyber world and how ai can play a role uh, in between those two things right so there are uh, i think this is a little own number about like 30 plus faculty from all of these dif different departments working on uh, various ai related areas and very strong international visibility in terms of publications and recognition from others. So anyway, so this is a starting point and I thought I'll just point it out uh, in case you're not aware. So now coming to the uh, main content of the talk. Um, so, so this is kind of uh, the thesis of our uh, group, which is that uh, background knowledge is really key to intelligent decision making, right? So um, with uh, advances in AI and machine learning, uh, we are asking machines to do lots of non-trivial tasks that machines have not been doing traditionally, but we humans have been doing it, right? So the example that I use is like, you know, if I have to like lift this particular remote, I already have some idea about like, you know, how much this is going to weigh, right? And I'm using appropriate amount of force to lift this particular thing, right? So how did I know like, you know, how much this is going to weigh? Uh, I have uh, like interacted with the world right you know, right from my birth or even like you know right from the womb where we start learning and uh, we have built a no model or knowledge model about the world and we are utilizing that knowledge to do this particular lifting task well right similarly like you know if you want to uh, invest in the stock market then you will do like you know, lots of background research about the companies the products who is running those companies and things like that right so you utilize lots of knowledge about the world, both common sense and factual, and you utilize that knowledge to make those decisions well, right? So now with advances in AI and machine learning, we are asking machines to do those same tasks for us, right, on our behalf, but they don't usually share that same context, same worldview that you and I take for granted and really is really critical to do these non-trivial tasks well, right? So that seems a little bit unfair, right? Because we are asking them to do that same task, but not empowering them with the same resources that are necessary, right? So, so that's kind of like our goal in how we can make machines more knowledgeable, 
right? So make them more aware about the knowledge and the surrounding so that they can utilize all of that world knowledge to do those non-trivial AI tasks well for us, right? So that's the goal. So, and it will become clear what I mean. So now just to drive home the point, let's say that like, you know, I don't have, I mean, all of us are busy people. We don't have like, you know, time in the morning to go to like 10 different websites and like know about what's going on in today's uh, world, right? It's a fast changing world. News is constantly becoming available. So I want a system which will summarize the news for me so that I can go over uh, those uh, summarized news yeah, like you know, during breakfast time or so. So uh, a system like that, uh, like, you know, can crawl through the web and then it comes across a sentence like this, State Farm stocks tumble along with Berkshire Hathaway, right? So in order to make sense of this particular sentence, we need to know that there is a concept called company, right? Two of whose instances are mentioned here. One is State Farm, the other one is Berkshire Hathaway, right? There is also something called a stock market where these company stocks are traded, right? Uh, and these, uh, and there is a price volatility associated with them. And this, like, you know, stock prices are very, even in like a nanosecond level nowadays, right? So in order to make sense of this sentence, you need to know about all of this background knowledge, right? So a concept called companies, stock market, prices, volatility, and all of that, right? But none of those are mentioned in this sentence itself, right? So whoever wrote that sentence and communicated this to us, expected that we would have all of that background knowledge and we would utilize that knowledge to make sense of this particular sentence, right? Because that's how we communicate, right? Uh, like, you know, we have like a shared understanding uh, uh, about our worldview and with respect to that, we are communicating, right? So I'm going to tell you stuff that I think that you don't know, right? Because if I keep on telling everything, first of all, we don't have that much time to cover all that ground and it will be very boring for you, right? So if I keep on telling you like you know, everything that you know, so, uh, so yeah, that's the nature of language, and we need uh, background knowledge to uh, make this kind of inference as well. So now, even if you have all of that knowledge, like you know, why there might be a correlation between the stock prices of these two companies, that's not immediately clear, right? Uh, but if I, by the way, anyone can guess. Uh, that's fine. Sorry, fifty dollar. What is the fifty dollar? Uh huh. So, but why there is a correlation between them? Um, yeah, that could be one explanation. Yeah, but I don't know whether that's actually true. But it could be, right? Berkshire invests in lots of companies. But here is one plausible explanation, right? So what's happening is, uh, so we have uh, seen Berkshire here, right? And uh, they have a subsidiary called Heinz, right? Heinz you may have seen, right? So those tomato ketchup bottles, right? Of course, they do lots of things, but that's probably the most prominent. And they're insured by this insurance company, State Farm, right? So one of the things the market may have uh, thought of is that, like, you know, uh, the lowering of the stock prices of Berkshire is because of some, some bad thing happening to its subsidiary, Heinz. And the losses of Heinz are going to get transferred to this insuring company, State Farm, so their prospects also don't look very good, right? So that needs to be factored it into the price, so State Farm stock prices are also coming down, right? So uh, hopefully our interpretation and analysis of this particular sentence is a little bit deeper now, right? So when we had access to this kind of structured knowledge compared to, say, 30 seconds before when we didn't have that structured knowledge, right? So do you agree with me on that or, yeah, okay. So this fragment of a graph, right, uh, is uh, is part of a much bigger graph, is what we call is the knowledge graph, right? So that's what you saw in the title, where the nodes are entities or objects of interest, and the typed edges are the relationships connecting these entities, right? So State Farm Insured Heinz Company is basically a, a, a fragment or a belief or a knowledge fragment, right? So our goal is, if you're able to build this kind of graph at scale, and make it available to these intelligent agents, then their inference capabilities, their analytical capabilities are going to improve significantly. Just like you know, our interpretation improved here when we had access to this, right? So is that, are you on board, right? So that's where our research is focused on, right? So how we can, first of all, build these kind of graphs at scale and how we can do inferences over them to empower 
uh, these uh, intelligent agents, AI machine learning. Okay. So, uh, so the NEL project at CMU, uh, which stands for Never Ending Language Learning, is basically one attempt to build this kind of knowledge graph by reading web documents on a continuous basis. Right? So before joining ISC, I was part of this project, and we continue to collaborate, and we uh, are following that line of research also here at ISC. So uh, this is actually a fragment of a knowledge graph that NEL has built. So NEL has been running for more than eight years now. So it started January 12, 2010, and has been running all along. And so it has like, you know, figured out that Toronto Maple Leafs is a hockey team. Their hometown is Toronto. They won Stanley Cup and things like that. Right? Uh, so this is kind of like a little bit bigger fragment than like the Heinz example that we saw earlier. So NEL has about uh, currently about 100 million such edges uh, in its knowledge graph. Right? So, and this is just a fragment that you have seen. And if you're interested, you can go and browse this URL. Uh, go to this URL, which is uh, rtw.ml.cmu.edu. Where RTW stands for read the web, right? So where like you know, Nell is basically trying to read the web, literally, and then uh, build this structure. And you can go and browse this uh, knowledge graph there, all the providences that are used to extract uh, all of this knowledge, right? Uh, if you are on Twitter, uh, then you can also follow Nell at this uh, handle, CMU Nell. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there are, there are a few thousand followers, actually. Uh, we hope that most of them are humans. But on Twitter, you don't know what's happening, right? Uh, and also, there are like you no know, conversations between Nell and those followers. So Nell tweets things from time to time that it thinks is interesting, and those supposedly human followers gives feedback, both positive and negative, right? Whether it's right, sorry, they can be bought as well. Yeah. So that's why I said like you know, uh, hopefully most of them are uh, humans because there is no like you know, economic incentive to follow an AI agent, right? So for others to build lots of bots. Uh, but anyway, internet is a strange place, so we don't know. Um, okay, but so I'm not going to talk about NEL today. So that's like you know, a whole another talk, like how it works and all. So I will talk about some of the more recent work in this direction we have been doing in my group. Okay, so before proceeding further, uh, there are uh, I'd like to like uh, list out two uh, uh, d different but pot potentially complementary views of knowledge. So one is this knowledge graph view, which is graph-centric, symbolic, which is easy for us to uh, understand and comprehend, right? Uh, which is what we've been talking about. And then uh, with this uh, advances in deep learning and representation learning mechanism, we can also think of these concepts and relationships as points in high-dimensional spaces, right? So each one of them is a vector. So just for uh, easier presentation, I have put them in a two-dimensional space, right? But usually they will lie on a high-dimensional space like say 100, 300, 500 dimensions, right? So uh, on one side you have this graphical representation of knowledge, on the other side you have this dense representation of knowledge, right? So we think of this as a spectrum, right? Both are trying to kind of like you know, do knowledge representation, how like our meanings, uh, kind of like our view of the world and we are trying to encode those uh, objects and the relationships among them, right? And we think of this as a spectrum, right? And uh, there is no need to kind of like choose one end or the other, and we are interested in how we can go back and forth between these two representations, right? A lot of the work that we do, some of which will also uh, get uh, like, you know, presented here and later in the talk, in trying to kind of like go back and forth between these two types of representations, right? So is that clear? Uh, then also there are, uh, within those knowledge graphs on the left side, there are also two types of knowledge graphs that you could build, right? So given a sentence like uh, Obama was the president of USA, uh, many people feel that like no, this should not have been, or they wish that this should not have been like past tense, right? Given everything else going on. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah. So like, you know, given a sentence like this, one form will be this ontological knowledge graph where everything will be normalized and like not canonicalized, right? So we have an entity called Barack Obama, uh, we have an entity called USA, and there is a precedent of relationship, right? So this is like your, uh, it's, it's like, you know, like a well-normalized relation that kind of like, you know, there is some sort of like a schema and an ontology to capture this kind of knowledge graph, right? That's one. So the benefit of this is like, you know, the, it's high precision, 
uh, tends to be canonicalized or normalized. And then, uh, but the downside is like, you know, it requires supervision to build these kind of graphs, right? Uh, the NEL graph that you saw earlier, NEL knowledge graph, is an ontological knowledge graph, right? Uh, although NEL is kind of like trying to cut down on the supervision, but some could still see that as a bottleneck. But on the other side, you have this ontology free or open knowledge graph, right? Where uh, you basically just kind of like represent everything at a surface form, right? So in this, from this particular sentence, I will say like, hey, Obama. So what I'm putting in quotes is basically just these noun phrases or surface strings, right? And without quotes are is this some sort of like a normalized entities, right? So uh, here, like, you know, Obama was president of USA will be just like stored as it is, with whatever it found on the sentence, right? So the problem here is like, you know, Obama and Barack Obama could potentially be two different nodes in this open knowledge, graph, right? So, uh, but the good point here is that it's like, you know, very easy to build, right? Because there are general purpose tools to build these kind of graphs and you can just throw them on your data, right? Uh, you get like high recall, but the problem is this will result in a fragmented view of the world, right? Because you will think Obama, Mr. Obama and Barack Obama are all three different nodes, right? Or three different entities, which is not ideal because we want to consolidate all of them, right? So that's the problem of canonicalization or normalization that we'll touch on later on in the talk. Okay. So, okay, so there are like you know, these two views, ontological and open, and in many of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, will be uh, like, you know, how we can start off from an open knowledge graph setting and slowly move towards ontological knowledge graph, right? This is easy to get started with, right? But finally, this is easy to work with because that gives you a consolidated, normalized view of the world, okay? okay. So, uh, so today's talk I have divided into three parts. So in one first part, uh, we'll kind of like look at the problem of relation schema induction. So how do we kind of like discover these types of knowledge when you're just given a domain's data, right? Uh, this precedent of relationship. Second one is a problem of canonicalization. How do you figure out that Obama and Barack Obama are actually one entity, right? And then finally, I will conclude uh, with some related work, other related work from my group, right? Okay, before proceeding further, any uh, questions so far? In, yes. Yeah. Right, so that's a good question. So what you could do is, so like, no, he's not president right now, right? but you could have additional attributes here to kind of like say that like I will like put time, right? So that he was president from uh, what, like 2008 to 2016 or 17, something like that, right? Yeah. So we can basically have additional annotations to capture when those particular beliefs were true. So we call that the problem of temporal scoping, right? And in fact, we do work on that, like, you know, how we can because the facts are not universally true, how we can put those additional timestamps on those? Good question. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So, uh, so that, I mean, like, you know, I mean, people have written papers about, like, you know, whenever they are, like, building those tools, right? So there are, like, you know, lots of tools, like, only and all. And they would do, like, evaluations on those tools about, about the extractions, like, you know, what is the precision recall and things like that. Which one? Here? Yeah. So these are kind of not, like, semantic related supervision. So usually what they will do is they will do, like, a syntactic analysis, right? So they will do some sort of parsing of the sentence and then kind of like you know, extract information based on the parse structure, right? Now parsing, like those of you who are aware, is kind of like roughly a one problem per language, right? So like you know, if you annotate, say if you are trying to do dependency parsing, you just annotate data, label data once, and for like 80-90% you know, of the time, that's going to work, right? So that's when it's still supervised, but it's supervised at the syntax level, not at the semantics level. Whatever we are talking about today, is at the semantics level, like no meaning, semantics, and all of that. Is there a question here? Yeah. Yes.
Um, yeah, but how will you do the causal analysis, right? So you have to, because the sentence itself, my point is that a sentence itself doesn't contain enough information to make all those inferences, right? So you kind of like bring in all this uh, additional knowledge because the writer expects that like, you know, you know all of those things to kind of like support that inference. So like, you know, once you have that knowledge, then you can do various types of inferences using causal inference. Right? You can even do maybe causal inference over the graph itself. Yes. Yeah, so, so that again is a subjective, right? So like, you know, maybe you believe uh, he was a good man. I, I believe that he was a bad man, right? So uh, that will be kind of like to capture using context, right? So I can have the same edge, right? And then I could also put like, who, what is the source who believes in this particular factor, right? So time that was uh, mentioned earlier is another type of context, right? So that particular fact is true in the context of something, right? So that context could be who is the holder of that belief or in what time it was true, right? So that's why by putting additional context on these things, which are additional attributes, you can kind of like restrict the scope of the uh, validity of those particular things. Um, so for uh, Nell, there is a Portuguese version. Uh, because we have some collaborators in Brazil, and I believe there is some effort in building one in Spanish. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, uh, I mean, like, you know, the if you want to think of these as, like, relations or schemas, those are going to be different, right? Because many of these uh, different... Uh, surface forms are going to get normalized to that one relation there, right? Or many of these entities here are going to collapse into one entity there, right? So that way it's different. But otherwise, like, a, a, but both are still graphs, right? But then on the, if you have a look at the dense well version, right, then that is very different, right? So the, where everything is vectors there. Any other question? Okay, yeah, so please uh, stop me at any time, right? Because I prefer it to be a dialogue rather than a monologue here. Uh, yeah, by the way, these are also not like, you know, uh, like abstract, like academic work, right? So if you go to like any major company now, uh, like, you know, they will have like a serious effort in building knowledge graph. Uh, like, you know, if you go to like Google kind of like pioneered, but like uh, Microsoft, Amazon, wherever you go, right? So they will have like some, uh, version of knowledge graph effort, serious effort in this direction. And also, like, you know, when you do, like, Google search, you may have seen that panel on the right-hand side, right? Uh, have you seen that rectangular box, right? So that is actually called a knowledge panel, right? So hopefully that improves your web search experience because you can get, like, a you know, quickly knowledge about that entity that you're looking for. So that internally is served from a knowledge graph that Google has, uh, I mean, acquired, but also extended internally after. So yeah, so we are like you know, already, even though you may not know, but we are already beneficiaries of knowledge graph uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Okay, so now coming to the first part. Uh, so the, here the goal is how we can build domain-specific knowledge graphs, right? So when I uh, joined here and uh, like you know, started talking pe with people primarily from industry, and I was telling them about Nell and all this stuff, and their point was like, you know, that's great, but we have the, this uh, domain-specific corpora, right? So be it like insurance domain, medical domain, and all. So can you help us build a knowledge model specific to that particular domain data, right? So that raises a few challenges. So one is that how do you even know what are the relations or like the you know, knowledge I should be extracting from that particular uh, domain data, right? Uh, so, so that's kind of like got us down into like, you know, how we can do this relation schema induction problem. So this is joint work with my PhD student mother, uh, project assistant Uday, uh, I guess former project assistant. So now he is in US doing PhD and in collaboration with Manish from Microsoft Research. Here are the two papers and most of the work we do, we also uh, release source code. So if you're interested, you can follow up and I'll point this kind of uh, URLs. Uh, mostly shared through GitHub uh, that you can try out if you find this thing interesting. 
So anyway, so the uh, need for, I guess, like building domain specific knowledge graph I've already listed. So what is the relation schema induction problem? So given, let's say, I have these sentences from like a medical or uh, like in a biomedical or clinical domain. So one of them says John underwent angioplasty last Tuesday, other one Sam will undergo tonsillectomy and sense that cells that undergo meiosis, right? So given these sentences, I would like to infer that there is an undergo relationship uh, in the sense patients undergoing surgery, right? And then there is a cells undergoing division, that's another relationship here, right? So once I have discovered these relations, which is what we call as the relation schemas, then the next problem will be to identify the instances of these relations, right? So there you can utilize systems like NEL uh, to figure out those instances of these relations. But the first step is to uh, discover these relations and their schemas, right? Uh, and the common practice right now is that you will go and ask experts, right? So for like, you know, in this clinical domain, hey, give me the list of relations and categories that I should care about in this particular domain. But like, you know, experts uh, have very little time. First of all, they're expensive, right? And then the limited time that you have access to, uh, they can only give you like a partial listing of the domain's data, right? And not like the comprehensive listing of everything that's necessary. So that's why we are interested in how we can automatically discover these kind of relation schemas automatically uh, from the data, given just the unstructured data from the domain. Right? Unstructured data, I mean, it's just like, you know, data, uh, like, you know, documents, emails, right? So, uh, which is just like text written in natural language. Is the problem clear? Yes? Okay. So uh, we uh, pose this as a tensor factorization problem, right? So uh, what is tensor? Uh, tensors are basically higher dimensional generalizations of matrices, right? So everyone knows matrix here, right? So matrix has two dimensions, right? Tensors have more dimensions, right? So uh, like, you know, more than two. So what we do is, so we have this access to uh, these uh, sentences from our target domain, right? So let's say the medical domain here. And then by utilizing these open IE triples, these are these open information extraction tools, uh, we can get triples of this form, right? So these are like subject, predicate, object triples, right? That Sam undergo uh, surgery, right? There are also additional attribution here called like next Tuesday, but we are ignoring that here. So what we do is uh, from this uh, domain data, we run these open IE tools and get these kind of triples, right? We also aggregate those triples, and for all of those triples, we also get some counts, right? So how many times a particular triple was found in the corpus, right? Then what we do is we represent those triples uh, and their counts in the form of a tensor, right? Where we have a three-dimensional tensor here, where the first dimension corresponds to the subject dimension, right? Second uh, mode here corresponds to this object dimension. And then the third one is the undergo, which is the predicate or relation, right? So our goal will be to, uh, uh, by the way, the cell here, right, which is uniquely identified by a corresponding subject, predicate, and object, will uh, store some sort of normalized counts of this, uh, normalized versions of these counts, right? So now our goal will be to, uh, so like, you know, for a schema, we need to group together these noun phrases into some categories, right? So maybe we want to say that like the Sam John actually belongs to some grouping or cluster called the patient cluster, right? So let's call that A2 with some soft membership probabilities, right? And then surgery like belongs to its own cluster, which is that surgery category, right? So we have these noun phrases from the open eye extraction, and then we would like to induce these categories, right? <coughs> patient surgery and all. And then also we'd like to discover the associations among these induced categories, right? Which is, uh, which will give us basically this final uh, relation and its schema, right? So this is the final schema we are interested in, right? Where this relation will connect these two latent uh, categories. And those categories themselves are going to be expressed in terms of the noun phrases that participate in that induced category. Is this clear, right? And we want to do all of these things jointly at the same time, right? Discovery of categories and uh, finding out the associations among those categories, which is what will give us the relations. Right? 
So we pose that as a tensor factorization problem, right? So this is the input tensor that we had built in the previous slide, right? And we factorize this tensor in the form of this A matrix, this core tensor R, and then the transpose of this A matrix again on the other side, right? So what this A matrix is giving me is basically a mapping from uh, these noun phrases to these latent categories. Right? So these are the induced categories that I would like to discover. Right? Uh, and then uh, this core tensor has a little bit of an interesting structure. So let's say I have uh, K induced categories. So that number K you have to provide, right? So how many clusters or categories you want, right? Now in this core tensor, it, you can think of this core tensor as basically a stacking of slices, right? Of uh, all these uh, different slices, each one of them is basically of size k cross k, right? And then for each unique relation uh, predicate, like you know, undergo, receive, and all, we'll have a separate slice in this core tensor, right? So the slice here that you see basically corresponds to this undergo relation from my predicate, right? So, and that is a k cross k slice, right? Where each cell here is basically recording the strength of association between two induced categories, right? So one on the subject side, the other on the object side, right? Now if you think about it, this cell is actually nothing but that one schema involving undergo that we would like to discover, right? Because here we are kind of like getting the mapping from that subject to the categories, right? On that other side, we are getting the mapping from the object to the category of the object, right? And then in the cell of this uh, uh, core tensor, we are getting a strength of association between those two subject and object categories, right? And uh, uh, the, the schema score is basically assigned by this point. So if you think, uh, like, you know, this is exactly the problem we would like to solve. I mean, Rascal is not a formulation that we came up with, right? You know, people have been working on tensor factorization for a while, but it's interesting that, like, you know, we found a direct application of that for our problem of relations to my induction. Okay, anyone has any questions about this? Yes. Oh, this is uh, what the factorization will give us, right? So we'll basically break this tensor into these components, right? And the goal will be that, like, you know, when you basically do this product of these three things, you will get another tensor X prime, right? Which is of the exactly the same size as X. And our goal will be to minimize that reconstruction error, right? So by doing that product, we'll get X prime, and we want X prime to be as close to X, right? So that's what this factorization is going to be. Okay, any other question? Uh, so yeah, so uh, after all this excitement, right, uh, we applied two different versions, actually, Parafac and Rascal to do this uh, factorization, to do this schema induction, tried them out on two different data sets. This is the state of the art for the respective called KBLDA. This is a LDA-based topic modeling approach to do the same thing, and higher is better here, and we fail miserably on both of these two tasks, right? So that's kind of like, uh, uh, like you know, what you go through in research, right? So the first thing that you try will probably not work most of the time, right? But you can either give up here, right, and say that like I'm not going to work on this. But if you persist, then you will get to those next slides that I'm going to show you, right? So where persistence is going to kind of like uh, pay off, right? So what we'll do is we'll basically uh, uh, like you not know, try to constrain the problem, uh, like you know, by adding additional side information. So what will happen is, let's say that like you know my expert kind of like gave me some partial supervision about like some knowledge about this uh, noun phrases and what their category memberships can be, right? So I'm going to add those as additional side information as an additional matrix here, right? And what I'm going to say is, hey, whenever you are doing this factorization it not only has to reconstruct this tensor X, but also has to reconstruct this side information matrix uh, W, okay? 
Uh, so now like, you know, our patience and persistence is starting to pay off, right? So we went from like here to here, right? Uh, in both cases, and we are like, you know, starting to be competitive uh, with respect to our uh, baseline. This is a KBL. So we get excited by this, right? So now we'll add more types of constraints, right? So more types of side information. By the way, two types of things are used here. One is the NP side information, and we also add like a non-negativity in the factorization. Right? So that's based on some past experience where we found that non-negativity is helpful. So uh, we also add relation side information, uh, which is to say that like, you know, based on our domain knowledge, maybe we know that in the medical domain, patients undergoing surgery or patients receiving some treatment have very similar meaning. Right? So we require, we say that like, hey, their schemas should also be similar to each other. Right? How do we enforce the schema? Basically, we require the respective slices in that core tensor for these two relations, undergo and receive, to be also close or similar to each other. Right? So we pose that as an additional criteria. Similar thing. So now when you put all of them together, we get the final model 6GF, right? Uh, which kind of like outperforms the uh, KBLDA baseline by significant margin on both things, right? So this is uh, kind of like a final model called SIGTF, and uh, this is the overall architecture of the model, right? So starting from the corpus, we are getting these triples, we are building uh, this uh, tensor and this side information matrices, and then jointly factorizing all of them into this latent component. Right? This is the objective. Uh, I know this is like early on in the morning, so math is probably not the first thing. Uh, but anyway, just to show that like, you know, the three components are basically what we are factorizing here and their expressions are uh, given here. Right? Here are some uh, examples of schemas induced by, uh, by the model SIGTF. So we'll come to this because we'll look into kind of like ex extensions of this subsequently. And then in addition to performance benefits, we also saw significant uh, boost in uh, runtime, right? So compared to this topic modeling based baseline, which is this uh, longer one, uh, 6TF gets about 11x speed up in performance, right? So we are not only doing better, but also doing it faster. Okay, so uh, so 6TF was about binary relation schema induction, right? So involving two arguments, but Madhav subsequently has also extended that to involve more than two arguments. Right? So because in many situations, uh, two arguments are not sufficient. Right? Uh, so that's what we call as a tensor factorization with back off. So that turns out that like, you know, if you kind of like follow that same recipe as before, right? so you, you create a tensor and then factorize, now in my tensor, rather than having three modes, I'm going to have like say five modes. Right? So that's an extremely sparse tensor, and if you like, you know, just factorize it straight away, then you don't get any meaningful output out of it. So what we do is we basically create multiple, we back off, and from that higher order tensor, we create multiple smaller order tensors, right? So if you have the modes, say, A, B, C, D, we are going to create tensors of, with modes A, B, C, B, C, D, A, C, D, A, B, D, right? We're going to factorize each one of those individually, but utilizing shared latent components. Uh, and you can think of each one of them is basically doing this 6TF problem, and then, uh, but they are having all these shared latent components. But now, from each one of those factorizations, we are going to get a bunch of binary relation schemas, right? But our, our interest in is getting like a higher order relation schema, right? So what we are going to do is, we are kind of like uh, going to put together, so if we know that like, you know, A4 is tightly related to C2, and C2 is also tightly related to B3, and A4 is also tightly related to B3, right? Because each one of them is an individual binary relation that we got. So we'll say that like, hey, if we kind of like complete this clique, right? So that kind of like gives me a higher order schema involving A4, C2, and B3, right? I'm going from binary to at least, uh, it's like not three arguments, here, right? So that's the idea that we'll do this tensor factorization based, uh, back off based factorization where we'll get these binary schemas, and then we are stitch them together using this click mining to get the higher order uh, relation schemas. Right? So here, here is an example uh, of uh, like you know, discovering uh, this higher order schema involving four arguments. So this is in a shooting's data set. 
uh, uh, involving this victim identification relation. So this is kind of like saying police uh, identifying, first argument is the police identifying this victim, when this identification happened and where this identification happened. And we show this to humans and humans give us the judgment valid or invalid. So we aggregate all those judgments to get the final score, which is what you had seen previously. Right? So uh, and, and this, is a, uh, this is an ACL uh, 2018 paper. And uh, so if you're interested, you can go and take a look at the details of this, right? Yes. Uh, that's what the human judgment has given, right? So because these are automated methods, they are not perfect, right? Uh, uh, the A1, B1, and C5. Uh, ah, C6 is missing, but you have to look at this relation, right? The police saying something about victim is probably at, at least this particular annotator didn't think that is a valid relation schema, right? So it's not so much about a question about the uh, arguments, right? But whether they can come together with respect to this relation in a meaningful way, right? So that's what the annotator judge is to be invalid. Yes. Yeah, so against these judgments. That's right. That's right. So humans would have seen exactly something like this, right? So they would have given these valid invalid judgments. We uh, kind of like use multiple annotators, I think about three. Yes, so they have access to the data and they also may have some domain knowledge from that particular data. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. So in fact, that will be a very good situation for us, right? Because uh, you have very little support for receiving your corpus, right? So you're unlikely to get any meaningful schemas for them, right? But now we are kind of like tying them to like a more popular relation, right? And then saying that like, hey, their schema should be kind of like similar. So maybe like this more popular entity schemas will kind of like is going to get copied to that uh, lower frequency one, right? So that will be a good situation to handle sparsity of uh, relations. Yes. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, I mean, like knowledge graphs will have a scope, right? So I mean, there are kind of like increasing amount of work in like trying to utilize knowledge graphs for doing recommendations, right? And this is kind of like a one step towards uh, like you know, building those kind of graphs in a domain specific. How much time do I have? I have a 15 minutes, okay. So we know it might be a little bit of a wait. I think we started late, so. Okay, uh, so the second problem that I want to talk about uh, is this problem of canonicalization, right? So this is that Barack Obama and Mr. Obama problem, thanks. Uh, so this was presented in uh, WWW uh, 2018. Again, the source code is available here. And uh, the system is called SESI, uh, which is canonicalizations using embeddings and side information. So this is a joint work with my PhD student Shikhar and former master students Prince. So, uh, you're already familiar uh, with this canonicalization problem where like, you know, uh, one triple I will get something like Bangalore, capital of Karnataka, another triple is going to say Bangalore has population 11 million. I want to say Bangalore and Bangalore are actually the same entity, right? So like, you know, given this bunch of noun phrases, I would like to say that uh, Barack Obama and Mr. Obama is one entity, George Bush and another, Madrid is another, but Mumbai and Bombay are actually the same entity, right? So how do we discover this kind of mapping? So uh, what we do is uh, we propose uh, this architecture called SESI, which uh, given this uh, uh, natural language document, it's going to do this open uh, knowledge graph construction by running these open eye triples. I'm going to get this subject, predicate, object triples exactly like before. And then I'm going to kind of like, you know, rather than building a tensor now, I'm just going to organize them as a graph, right? Because each triple is nothing but an edge in my open 
knowledge graph, right? So now I'm going to embed each one of those nodes and relations as a point in this high dimensional space, right? So that's what is called this knowledge graph embedding, right? So over the last couple of years, lots of methods have been developed of how you can get this graph and embed the nodes in a high dimensional space, right? So that's what we are going to do. And then we are going to finally do some clustering over this learned representation space where the idea will be that uh, points that are kind of like, you know, synonyms of each other are going to get projected into that same part of space, right? So hopefully Obama and Barack Obama are going to be co-located in that projected space, right? So that's the core idea, but rather than doing this in a straightforward way, we'll also kind of like add one more twist and to say that like, hey, when we are trying to learn this representation, maybe I have access to some additional side information, right? Maybe some expert gave me something uh, or like, you know, some other uh, like you know, existing models may also say like, hey, Obama and Barack Obama, I think they are kind of like, you know, similar. They could be kind of like the same entity, right? So if I have those kind of partial hints, we'll basically uh, uh, incorporate all those additional side information partial hints in learning and, and like, you know, enforce them during the representation learning stage, right? So, uh, yeah, and then like, you know, we utilize various types of side information. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, in the next slide, we'll take a look at that. But as I mentioned, like, you know, lots of methods for KG embedding have been developed over the last couple of years. So we'll use this method called holographic embedding uh, or HOLI, uh, which is as a, as a representative of the state of the art in this area. So I don't have time today to get into the internals of how Holy works, but just think that like, you know, at a conceptual level, given this graph, it will give me a vector representation of all of the nodes in the graph. As a side information, uh, we ut utilize nine different types of side information in CC. One of them could be the uh, idea of entity linking, which says that like, hey, US and America, actually they got both mapped to this uh, entity called uh, United States of America, so I would like their embeddings to be close to each other, right? Uh, similarly, there are these paraphrase data databases uh, developed within the NLP community, which would say that like, hey, head of and chief of kind of like roughly mean the same thing, right? So I want their embeddings to be close to each other, right? So that's why we have like this noun phrase and relation phrase side information, which we are uh, imposing as additional constraints during the representation learning stage. Similarly, there are other ones, uh, but in terms of time, I will kind of like skip this. So this is the overall optimization of the SESI method. So first uh, is the knowledge graph embedding, right? Uh, which is kind of coming from Holy. Then this theta is iterating over these different types of noun phrase related side information. If uh, some such side information says that V and V prime are actually like you know, similar to each other, so we want their embeddings in that projected space to be close to each other, right? So remember, this is a minimization objective. So we want these things to be close to each other, right? Similarly, if someone says like relation U and U prime are similar, so we want their embeddings to be also similar to each other. And then some regularization to make sure that like that it doesn't overfit to the limited data. Right? And then we develop some iterative methods to solve this objective. And uh, this was the state-of-the-art baseline before we started the work, so 71.5. So compared to that, we get a significant boost in performance, about 15% absolute improvement. So here is a canonical, uh, uh, like, you know, some uh, qualitative example. So uh, the point here is, so we kind of, like, you know, project them into high dimensions, I don't know, maybe like 100 or 300, and then using some Disney visualization, we project them into two dimensions because we cannot look at 300 dimensions, right? So the point here is, if points are co-located uh, with each other, then that's the system's way of saying that, like, I think this is a canonical cluster, right? So here you see some interesting patterns, like GlaxoSmithKline and GSK uh, are kind of, like, you know, put together uh, in the same space, so, and which, in fact, are, like, a you know, canonical representation of that same entity, right? So. This is interesting because if you kind of like, you know, started doing edit distance or just do comparisons based on the string, on surface, they look very different, right? So their edit distances are going to be quite large, but by utilizing this structure about these uh, entities, 
uh, we are able to learn a good representation, which is help us in uh, doing that uh, canonicalization problem better. Similarly, we do for relations as well. Uh, yeah. So this is just. So I, uh, one thing I learned myself is that I didn't know that Sakya Muni is another name for Gautam Buddha. Right? How many of you knew before? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So this is like a religious teaching to you as well for today, right? Uh, which Sessi is making available to us. Okay. So. Okay, so, any, so uh, by the way, the canonicalization is a really important problem, right? So if you kind of like go in any practical situations where data are, is being generated from two sources where the teams kind of like, you know, didn't kind of uh, no, uh, have prior discussions to normalize the terminologies, everyone is going to use their own way of referring to things, and that kind of like leads to a fractured view of the data, right? And so canonicalization can help you bring together and create a consolidated. Okay, any questions so far? Everything is clear? Yes, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, in fact, this uh, glove that you see, that's a word vector, right? So that, that gets about like 82.7. So on top of that, by utilizing all these constraints and structure, we are going to get about like 4 or 5% improvement. And for CC also, we uh, initialize with glove, and that, but we refine that embedding using all of those other uh, bells and whistles. Yeah. Um, lossy as in like, what do you want, what do you mean? Yes. You may actually get more things, all right? So you will kind of like, uh, in fact, people utilize these things to kind of like do link prediction, right? So even like in initial edges that were not there, and uh, you will kind of like start establishing those connections, right? Because now it gives you kind of like a smooth space to operate over. But it will also depend on what is your uh, deconversion process, right? So if that uh, it has to be dependent on the quality of that thing as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we have also done some work on uh, entity linking. Uh, so in particular, so entity linking is like, you know, given like uh, text dimensions, how do you like link them to entities in the uh, knowledge graph? Uh, but what we find is that like you know, rather than uh, doing like uh, entity linking directly on the graph, if you are able to like you know, densify the graph first, like you know, add these additional nodes and edges by analyzing text corpus and then do entity linking, uh, we also embed this uh, densified knowledge graph into again like a similar uh, vectorial space and then do entity linking on top of that, we find that there is a boost in performance. Right? In fact, I think this is, so this is what we call Elden which stands for entity linking with densified knowledge. Okay. I think this is the uh, state of the art method uh, for entity linking. And then uh, I've been talking about a lot of like, you know, embedding knowledge graphs. And over the last few years, there is a soup of methods that have been developed, like, you know, holy, complex, and lots of others. But the question is, uh, like, you know, people are looking at them more from a performance point of view, right? So how well I am able to like, you know, do link prediction or different performance on tasks, but it wasn't clear like, you know, what vectors are being learned by these processes, right? How are they oriented in space, right? So that got us thinking, and uh, we started, wanted to understand the geometry of these embeddings and vectors that are being learned by the systems. So we have an upcoming paper in ACL, uh, so this is joint work with my PhD student Chandra Haas and master student Aritya. So here we kind of like broadly divided these uh, uh, KG embedding methods into two classes. One is this additive method, the other one is multiplicative. So what happens is this KG embedding method, given a triple, they will assign you a score based on some function, right? For some of them, that function is additive, and for others, that's basically multiplicative. Right? So what we found was that these additive methods uh, kind of like tend to spread around these vectors in the, uh, in the space, right? So they kind of like organize them in a very, uh, wide cone, so that's what we call as the low conicity, right? In contrast, these multiplicative methods tend to concentrate all these embeddings that they're learning 
in kind of like a very small part of the space. So they tend to have a high cohesion. Right? So this was an interesting observation, right? That like you know, how these vectors that are learned by this method are actually spread out in space. So we have a lot more analysis and interpretation of these results. So if you're interested, you can go and look at this ACL paper. Uh, time is also really important, right? So it also came up in prior discussions. So uh, let's say like, you know, if you are given some text segment like this, as Swiss adopted that form of taxation in 1995, uh, the concession was approved by the government last September, four years after the IOC approved it or something, right? So the problem is, if I give you text fragment like this or document like this, how can you predict, right? So you know, you know what time this particular document was written or what time this content of the document is referring to, right? So with all the advances in like, you know, IR and web search, we still don't have any tool which can, uh, which I can query, issue queries of the form like, hey, show me all documents that are talking about events from 1975, right? We don't have that right now. So this is a one attempt to do this, right? So where we are time stamping documents. So uh, these are basically performances of some two competing methods. So first of all, this is a not very well uh, research area. So we could only find two baselines for this. And both of them were getting confused by this 1995 and this past tense that kind of like uh, is there uh, with respect to this, right? And so putting most of its probability mass on this 1996, right? But our method, which is called neural data, uh, is basically doing some sort of like a temporal reasoning here, right? Because we saw this 1995 and four years after, so it's adding that four years to 1995 to get this number of 1999, and it's putting most of its mass uh, on the correct answer, right? So it's, it's really uh, interesting that it's kind of like, you know, is able to do this kind of at least uh, uh, arithmetic involving time, at least in a restricted context, so to do this, uh, our system is called neural data. So that uses something called graph convolution networks. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, these are basically, so you may have heard uh, deep learning, right? So the GCNs are one way to do deep learning over graphs, right? And what we do is like, you know, given the document, we create some syntactic and temporal graphs over the document involving the time expressions and the events that are mentioned in the document, create a graph over them, uh, use GCN to learn the embeddings on all of those nodes, and based on those learn embeddings, we predict the time of the document. Right? And we find that, like, you know, compared to, so that's bursty sim data was the state of the art uh, before our work. So compared to that, on both of these two data sets, we get about, like, you know, 18 to 19% like absolute boost in performance, right? which is quite significant. And also we find that compared to these other baselines, even when neural data is making an error, right? Its errors are not that crazy, right? So like, you know, maybe it's like you know, off by uh, like you know, less than one year on average. So which is also uh, encouraging. Uh, so yeah, so this is kind of uh, a high level. So like, you know, there are lots of other work uh, going on in my group, uh, like you know, how we can build uh, knowledge graphs in a, a goal directed manner. Uh, time is important, as I was saying earlier, how we can do representation learning, but at scale, how we can learn a uh, neural distance supervision. So most of the current deep learning methods are effective uh, when you have millions of training instances, right? But uh, like you know, in many situations, you don't have access to that level of supervision. So the question is how you can move the needle and make them work with limited amounts of supervision. So. Uh, uh, we have some work on how we can train these deep models, but utilizing maybe noisy training instances, which we can automatically generate. Uh, one uh, work that we are doing is uh, how we can uh, capture knowledge from technical literature. So most of what I have been talking about so far is like you know, pure natural language, right? But many a times you may have like you know, figures, equations, mathematical notations, right? So from like research papers or technical manuals, if you want to extract knowledge, so now you need to think about all those mathematical equations, symbols and all, and how they kind of like gel well with your regular uh, natural language text, right? So that's an uncharted territory, right? So no, as far as I know, very little to no work has happened there. So we're just starting to work in that space. And then also looking at like, you know, by using something called this uh, generative adversarial uh, networks, how we can uh, generate uh, uh, training data automatically uh, by learning some distributions over the limited amounts of data. 
So it's not all work. We also have fun sometimes. In fact, we are going out for lunch today. Uh, so this is uh, currently seven PhD students in the lab. Uh, one more is going to join uh, this August and a couple of masters and research interns. Uh, and we are a relatively young group, about three years in existence. Uh, but I'm happy that people have graduated and gone on to do other interesting things, both in uh, industry and academia uh, worldwide. So, uh, so we are interested in overall going uh, from unstructured data uh, to this structured knowledge, so it's what is called the strings to things, right? Uh, and this is not a one-step process because new knowledge is becoming constantly available. So in addition to construction, we are also interested in how we can maintain and augment this knowledge. And construction of the knowledge is not the end goal. Uh, we would like to utilize them in non-trivial decision-making applications and see how their performance improves. And this also need not be a one-way street. We'd also like to see uh, like, you know, how these applications could dictate the growth of the knowledge, right? So in our group, uh, we are interested in this entire spectrum of construction, maintenance, and application of knowledge, with knowledge graphs forming a central data structure where everything connects. So in order to do this, uh, our work spans the areas of machine learning, natural language processing, and large-scale data analysis. Uh, we act, collaborate with other universities, in particular with the machine learning department at CMU, uh, and also very actively with lots of uh, companies uh, collaborating. So if you're interested in learning more, you can visit this URL, mollabisc.github.io. Uh, and also, this is, I think, like a, in my view, like in a very exciting area. One thing that I really like is uh, it touches pretty much any area of computer science, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, and then also, like, you know, in areas where it's not technically relevant, but it, those could be application domains, right? For example, we are talking with Siemens who do, like, combustion engines, right? No way related to computer science, but we want to build, like, a knowledge models for them, right? So this is just kind of, like, getting started. So there are lots and lots of opportunities, open problems to work on this. So if you're looking for thesis problems, your BTEC thesis, master's thesis problems, I encourage you to uh, give this area a chance and take a closer look and the problems uh, that are there, right? So there are a lot more things to talk about. Uh, I'm already over time keeping Vinod waiting here. Uh, so uh, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, do we have time or? No, no time. OK, no time for questions. But again, uh, is it a break now? Oh, 11, OK. OK, I'll be around, yeah. So I'll be there for the slides. Yeah. Yes, OK, thank you. Okay. Oh. Explain that natural language is unnatural. <laughs> right.